Hey, it's Craig. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Canadian History X early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Hey everyone, Craig Baird here. Before I begin today's story, I want to take a moment and ask that you check me out on Patreon at www.patreon.com slash Canada EHX. There are several tiers with great benefits, from ad-free content to t-shirts and other cool stuff. And if you're a fan of Canadian History X, make sure you check out my other shows, From John to Justin and Canada, A Yearly Journey. And don't forget, you can also donate directly to the show at www.canadaehx.com. It helps keep this show going. All right, on with the show. Long before explorers such as Anthony Henday, David Thompson, Alexander Mackenzie, or Lewis and Clark were born, there was a young man with a sense of adventure that took him to North America as an apprentice for the Hudson's Bay Company. He was the perfect man for the company to send out on a two-year mission to survey what became Canada and see things no European had ever seen to that point. Resourceful and driven, he loved the country and the indigenous people who inhabited it. It was a hard journey, and one that cemented his name in history. I'm Craig Baird, this is Canadian History X, and today I'm sharing the story of Henry Kelsey. Before we begin, a note that this episode features colonial and outdated language referring to the Indigenous peoples, which is being used in direct quotes from Henry Kelsey's diary. On May 2nd, 1670, King Charles II incorporated the Governor and Company of Adventurers of England trading into Hudson's Bay, most commonly known as the Hudson's Bay Company. After incorporation by the English Royal Charter in 1670, King Charles II gave the Hudson's Bay Company a monopoly over the Hudson Bay Basin, also known as Rupert's Land, a 3.8 million square kilometer area, one-third of modern-day Canada, stretching from Labrador and Baffin Island to the Rocky Mountains. If this sounds familiar, you'll remember I covered Rupert's Land about a month ago in my episode on the Manitoba Schools question, so be sure to check it out. Within that land were many First Nations who didn't realize their land had been claimed by a monarch half a world away. The day the charter was signed in London, England, a young boy of six, maybe seven, was just beginning his life. That boy was Henry Kelsey, born sometime around 1664. Who his parents were is mostly lost to history, but there is evidence Henry Kelsey spent part of his young life on the streets of London. If true, there's no surprise that the survival skills he picked up there served him well as he ventured into the North American wilderness late in life. Now we don't know much about young Kelsey's life, but at some point he joined the Hudson's Bay Company, and some records show it would have been around 1677 at the tender age of 13 when he was referred to as the boy Henry Kelsey. Then seven years later on May 17, 1684, Kelsey left England for a land he had never seen nor known. He crossed the Atlantic Ocean and arrived at York Factory, a settlement located on the southwestern shore of Hudson Bay in present-day northwestern Manitoba at the mouth of the Hayes River, approximately 200 kilometers south-southeast of Churchill, to become an apprentice, which would earn him eight pounds as a bonus at the end of his contract and two suits. Kelsey arrived at York Factory, a brand new fort built that same year, and the fifth one built by the company between 1668 and 1684. And life was hard. Kelsey wrote that in one week, several men died when a party went looking to find two missing men, and all they found was a shirt and a bone. These shocking details didn't dissuade him, and he was described as someone who made easy friends and was well-liked. As an apprentice for the Hudson's Bay Company, he wasn't allowed to hunt or speak with the indigenous people. Now, I couldn't find a specific reason for this, but I can only assume it's because hunting and getting to know the indigenous people would offer apprentices at the time options for a life different from the rigid life at the fort, and despite this rule, Kelsey simply did what he wanted. His superiors wrote he was, quote, a very active lad, delighting much in Indians' company, being never better pleased than when traveling among them. The feelings seemed to be mutual as indigenous people in the area seemed to like and respected Kelsey for his daring nature when he was out on hunts with them, but his disregard for rules eventually earned him a thrashing at the fort, and according to legend, he left the fort soon after. Search parties looked for him for several weeks, and when he wasn't found, they gave him up for dead. A few months went by, 
Then an indigenous man arrived at the fort with an English message written on birch bark stating that Kelsey was well and traveling with the indigenous people. The message asked if he could return to the fort for the winter. Kelsey's past transgressions were forgiven and he was given permission to return. And his time away from the fort proved that he could survive and that would send his life into a brand new trajectory. It did not take long for Kelsey to become fluent in Assiniboine and Cree as he also compiled an early Cree dictionary. When he returned to the fort, his superiors recognized Kelsey's adventurous spirit, his love for travel, along with his comfort among the indigenous people. And these skills likely played a role in the Hudson's Bay Company sanctioning his first official trip away from the fort. The journey would be simple and take a month to complete. He had to travel 200 kilometers to deliver mail to Fort Severn and come back while accompanied by a Dene boy. With this mission, his time as an apprentice ended in 1688 and he was given a 15-pound bonus, two suits, and 36 pounds in wages. He signed a new contract with the company, now earning 15 pounds per year. One year later, Kelsey and the same Dene boy traveled to the north on an expedition to find the Chippewan people and initiate trade negotiations. From June 17th to 26th, they journeyed 111 kilometers north of York Factory on the Hopewell before they were dropped off on the coast where they traveled along the western edge of Hudson Bay, but they found no one to trade with. Along the way, the Dene boy became apprehensive as they moved further into Chippewan territory and felt they could be in danger. Unable to convince the boy otherwise, the pair turned back towards York Factory on July 12th, but the journey, despite being in summer, was far from over. Kelsey wrote in his diary on July 25th, Today put from ye shore, it being dreadful to behold ye falls, we had to pass considering we had nothing to tie of raft but small log line and were forced to shoot three desperate falls. Kelsey and the Dene boy traveled back 142 kilometers to their initial drop-off stop and then the other 111 kilometers back to the fort. And despite the failure of this mission, another one was just on the horizon. In 1690, Hudson's Bay Company Governor George Geyer instructed Kelsey to embark on his greatest journey. He had to travel to the interior of the continent where no European had ever been before and convince the First Nations to trade with the Hudson's Bay Company. Now Kelsey had a keen sense of adventure, survival skills and good relations with the indigenous people because unlike many other traders at the time, he treated the indigenous people as equals and was willing to learn from them. On June 12, 1690, Kelsey left York Factory with a group of indigenous men and carried with him items to trade including hatchets, beads, and tobacco. He wrote in his journal, Then up ye river I with heavy heart did take my way and from all English part to live amongst ye natives of this place if God permits me for one two years space. The inland country of good report hath been by Indians but by English not yet seen. Up until Kelsey's mission in 1690, and for the first 150 years, the Hudson's Bay Company did not care about the interior of the continent. The company had convinced the indigenous peoples to come to their forts, and every spring, flotillas of canoes carried indigenous traders and thousands of furs. For the First Nations like the Cree, this was an excellent arrangement. The forts were within their territory and served as the middle ground for trading with the Hudson's Bay Company, where the Cree gave furs and in return received European goods such as guns and tools, which greatly increased their power. They quickly expanded their territory over other indigenous nations because of the shift in the balance of power. Now Kelsey's journey into the interior wasn't meant to be a land survey or for exploration. He was meant to trade to the name of the Hudson's Bay Company, and essentially he was the continent's first traveling salesperson. On July 10th, he stopped for winter and named the area Daring's Point after Sir Edward Daring, the deputy governor of the Hudson's Bay Company who died the previous year. He wrote in his diary, At Daring's Point after the frost, I set up a certain cross, in token of my being there, cut out on ye date of year, and likewise for it verifying the name, added to it my master's name. Why he named it after Daring is not known. There's no record that Kelsey ever knew him, but some historians speculate that Deering may have sponsored him as an apprentice with the Hudson's Bay Company. 200 years later, geologist Dr. J.B. Terrell did a geological survey of the area and believed that Deering's Point was located near the Paw, Manitoba, 520 kilometers northwest of Winnipeg. He wrote, This was probably the neck of the land visited by Henry Kelsey in 1690-91. 
From Daring's point, Kelsey instructed the indigenous guides to return to York Factory with a letter detailing his journey and listing the nations he had met so far. And after a long winter, his indigenous guides returned in the spring of 1691, carrying trade goods from the fort and instructions to obtain beaver pelts and return with representatives of the First Nations that he encountered so trade negotiations could be initiated. One item the guides brought with them was a peace pipe, something that proved important on the rest of Kelsey's journey. On July 15, 1691, the group set out further into the interior and by now the indigenous people with him called him Miss Top Ashish, meaning the little giant. Kelsey knew that his success depended on the indigenous people with him, and he wrote in his diary while on the prairie, Because I was alone and no friend could find, and once in my travels I was left behind, which struck fear and terror into me, but still I was resolved, the same country for it to see. Kelsey and the indigenous people with him journeyed up the Carrot River into present-day northeast Saskatchewan. This was when he noticed nature around him looked different from the northern forest he was used to, he wrote in his diary. The ground begins for it to be dry with wood, poplow and birch with ash that's very good, for the natives of this place which knows no use better than their wooden bows. A group of indigenous guides had gone ahead of him ten days earlier, leaving Kelsey with only a few men and women, and as they journeyed south, their trip became more difficult. The land was swampy and food was scarce as winter turned to spring, which became summer, yet food was still difficult to find, and starvation became a very serious concern. He wrote on July 19th, This morning we set forward into the woods, and having travelled about ten miles, pitched a tent and went out hunting, all returning in the evening, having killed nothing but two wood partridges and one squirrel. As the smaller group moved southwest into the interior, they slowly gained on the group ahead of them. From Deering's point, they journeyed 320 kilometers, reaching near to where Humboldt is today. During that time of only two weeks, they ate three fish, two partridges, a squirrel, three pigeons, two swans, and some berries. The group ahead of Kelsey ate grass to stay alive. Things did improve as Kelsey left the swampy land and reached what he called solid ground. The landscape had changed to grasslands, and game was more plentiful. On July 24, 1691, Kelsey caught up with the group ahead of them. That same day, a moose was hunted and Kelsey received as a gut, which was considered an honor. And news spread of their arrival, and before long, indigenous people arrived at Kelsey's camp to meet him. The location of this camp is a little hard to pinpoint as Kelsey wrote little of geographical features. One of the rare instances of this came on August 9th when he wrote, The river bends away much to the southward and runneth through a great part of the country. Today this is believed to be the South Saskatchewan River, which means Kelsey was travelling towards present-day Saskatoon. And this is where he encountered an animal he, nor any other European, had ever seen. The bison, which covered North America's Great Plains. From present-day northern Alberta to Mexico, they numbered in the millions and were a vital source of food and supplies for First Nations prior to the 19th century. Kelsey wrote of them with the common name Buffalo. Buffalo likewise is not like those ye northward. Their horns grow like English ox but black and short. On August 9th, Kelsey killed his first bison, which resulted in a huge feast that lasted until August 11th. The following day, Kelsey reached a location just north of Saskatoon. On August 20th, 1691, he met the Assiniboine, whom he referred to as the Stone, a name that came from a transliteration into French from Ojibwe. The Ojibwe called the Assiniboine Asimi Buan, meaning Stone Sioux. The Assiniboine called themselves Hohe Nakoda. The day of the meeting, he described the land around him as barren and made up of short, sticky grass, most likely bunch grasses. And although Kelsey called the land barren, he probably meant that it was bare, free of trees and open. I lived in Saskatchewan for many years, particularly in southern Saskatchewan, and there were very few trees out there. The Hudson's Bay Company used that wording to their advantage. For 200 years, the company resisted settlement in Rupert's land because they felt it would disrupt the lucrative fur trade, so they called the land barren and not fit for agriculture. It was not until the 1850s and 1860s when the Palliser expedition travelled there that the image of the prairies began to change and settlement began. In the fertile land of the Canadian prairie, Kelsey wrote of what was probably the first European encounter with a grizzly bear. He said, A great sort of bear which is bigger than a white bear and is neither white nor black but silver-haired like our rabbit. 
Today we associate the apex predator with the Rocky Mountains, but there was a time when the habitat extended to the Canadian prairies. Prior to European arrival, grizzlies were found on the western portions of central and southern Saskatchewan until they were hunted to near extinction. In his diary, Kelsey stated he killed two grizzlies with two shots. And while he quite possibly killed two grizzlies, only using two gunshots is likely an exaggeration. The guns at the time were not incredibly accurate, especially at a long distance. By now, it was the end of August, and Kelsey noticed scattered groups of indigenous peoples coming together west of present-day Saskatoon for a huge gathering. There were upwards of 80 tents and 500 people. Kelsey used the opportunity to speak with many leaders and plan future trading. At the beginning of September, Kelsey reached Eagle Hills, a small rise in the prairie west of North Battleford, Saskatchewan. Kelsey had moved into Nehuatame territory. Now, modern scholars believe that they were the Nakoda or Blackfoot people, but it's not known for sure. Regardless, this was a new territory, and Kelsey camped in the hills while eight indigenous men stayed on guard in case of an attack. None came, and on September 9th, 1691, Kelsey reached present-day Cutknife, Saskatchewan. Almost 200 years later, in 1885, Cutknife became the scene of a major battle of the Northwest Resistance. The Canadian militia under Lieutenant Colonel William Otter attacked a Cree and Assiniboine encampment on the hill. It was a disaster for the Canadians, who were routed by the Indigenous warriors. I covered this story on several different episodes, including my episode on Chief Poundmaker, one of the earliest episodes I've ever done. But I will also be talking about this episode in a few months in my episode about the Northwest Resistance. Upon Kelsey's arrival at Cutknife, two Neowatame scouts reached him. He explained his mission through an interpreter, and they informed him of a Neowate camp two days behind them. Kelsey then turned around and ventured east. So far, Kelsey's mission from July 15th to September 12th had taken him 941 kilometers southwest of York Factory. When he found the Neowatame camp on September 12th, 1691, a large gathering was held with 11 tents and 60 people, and Kelsey spoke with an unnamed Neowatame chief, and together the two men shared a peace pipe. Then Kelsey said that the Neowatame could not kill the governor's friends anymore and gave the chief a gift. He wrote in his diary, I presented him with a present coat and sash cup and one of my guns with knives and tobacco and small quantities of powder and shot. In return, the chief agreed to meet Kelsey at Deering's Point in the spring. With the meeting concluded, Kelsey made the journey back to Deering's Point, which only took a few weeks as they traveled on the South Saskatchewan River and then the Carrot River. Kelsey then wintered from 1691 to 1692 with the Assiniboine, and when spring arrived, he waited for the Neowatame arrival. But it never came. He found out later that soon after he left, several of the chief's men were killed by the Nehethawais, today known as the Cree. As a result, the beleaguered chief chose not to venture out of his territory. Kelsey wrote, In September I brought those natives to peace but I had no sooner formed those natives turned my back. Some of them home Indians came upon their track, and for old grudges and their minds to fill, came up with them six-tenths of which they killed. The summer of 1692 is when Kelsey finally returned to York Factory, accompanied by some Assiniboine and Cree. The Hudson's Bay Company officials were very happy with Kelsey's journey, but their enthusiasm quickly disappeared. There was little interest among the higher-ups in venturing farther into the continent. It took another 60 years before another employee of the company ventured again into the interior of present-day Canada. Not until the 1770s when the Northwest Company was established that the Hudson's Bay Company finally moved inland. The Northwest Company built forts closer to the indigenous people to cut off the trade networks to the Hudson Bay Company, and the company had to adjust its strategy or perish. And before long, company forts dotted the interior of Canada. At the time, Kelsey made his journey. The company held a massive monopoly over the fur trade on the continent and there was no reason to change its methods. In their myopic view, if indigenous people in the interior want to trade, they would go to the company. Otherwise, the company would find others to trade with instead. Meanwhile, Kelsey returned to England briefly on September 12, 1693 when his contract with the Hudson's Bay Company ended. He signed on again on April 25, 1694 and returned to York Factory soon after. His arrival coincided with an escalation of King William's War, which is what the Nine Years' War was known as in North America. The Nine Years' War was a much larger conflict fought between the Grand Alliance consisting of the Dutch Republic, England, Scotland, the Spanish Empire, and the Holy Roman Empire against France. 
On September 4th, 1694, the war reached the Hudson's Bay Company shore. Pierre Le Moyne d'Iberville reached Nelson River, and by October 14th, York Factory surrendered to the French, and Kelsey assisted in negotiating the terms of surrender. York Factory was renamed Fort Bourbon, but it was winter, and there was nowhere to go, so the French and their English captives were forced to spend the winter together at the fort, and by the time spring arrived, both sides had lost several men to scurvy. Diberville waited months to capture the annual English supply ships, but by September 1695, they had not arrived. With no other option, he left 70 of his men behind to hold the fort and sailed for France with a load of furs. Ten months later, the English recaptured York Factory, and Kelsey was back in the employ of the Hudson's Bay Company, and once again, earning a paycheck. Unfortunately, King William's war raged on, and Deverville would not let York Factory slip from his fingers again. On September 5, 1697, he arrived at York Factory with his flagship, the Pelican, to recapture the fort that he had once lost. In the distance, he saw a ship approaching which he believed was part of the fleet that had sailed with him from France. What he did not know was that the three ships, La Profond, La Vesp, and La Palmier, had engaged in a battle with the English ship, the Hampshire, only days earlier. The approaching ship was not one of the ones he was waiting for, it was the Hampshire. What followed was the Battle of Hudson Bay, the largest naval battle in the history of the North American Arctic. Deberville was heavily outgunned, 44 French guns to the 114 the English had at their disposal, yet he headed into battle with guns blazing. For two and a half hours, the two sides engaged in a ferocious sea battle. The Pelican was able to disable the mainsail of the Daring early in the battle, while the Royal Hudson's Bay which came to the aid of the Daring, was crippled by the Pelican through a volley of shots. With those two ships out of contention, the Hampshire, a more powerful ship, took over. The Pelican and the Hampshire, the two biggest ships in the battle, fought a vicious and brutal broadside battle, and as it raged on, it looked as though the French were about to lose. But Captain de Berville was not about to surrender. The captain of the Hampshire respected this, and he admired de Berville's bravery and raised a glass of wine to toast him on his ship. Then... Everything changed. A shot from the Pelican hit the powder magazine of the Hampshire, igniting the power and causing an explosion which quickly sank the ship beneath the waves. The captain, who raised his glass out of respect minutes earlier, went down with his ship. While one ship surrendered and the other fled, the French ship was in bad shape. It was fatally damaged and much of it was below the water line. And even though the Pelican had won the battle, the crew had to abandon the ship. As the ship sank, Diberville ran aground and his men walked through neck-deep icy cold water to shore. They then spent the next several days hauling everything they could from the ship ashore, including its cannon, which came at a loss of 18 of his men who died from exposure. Then the missing French ships arrived a few days later, which allowed Diberville to coax the surrender of York Factory using the cannons from the Pelican as leverage. On September 13, 1697, Henry Bailey, factor or head of York Factory, surrendered the fort. Henry Kelsey was once again on hand before he was sent back to England, where he only remained a short time before he was called back to Canada. He spent enough time in England to marry Elizabeth Dix of London on April 7, 1698. Then, only a month and a half into his marriage, he signed a new contract with the Hudson's Bay Company and sailed over the Atlantic. Now earning £35 per year, he returned to Hudson Bay and was stationed at Fort Albany in James Bay in 1698. It was one of the few forts still under English control. In 1701, Kelsey was made the master of a trading frigate, which traded beaver pelts with the indigenous people along the coast of Hudson Bay. Two years later, he returned to England. At the time, he was making £50, equivalent to about $17,000 today. And it could be that he thought it was low wages, because he did not return to the Hudson's Bay Company for another two years, the longest stretch away from the company in his adult life. Then in 1705, he was made the chief trader of Fort Albany by the company, and now he had a salary of £100, or $35,000 in 2023. He stayed in Fort Albany for seven years until 1712, when he returned to England. A year later, the treaty was signed and York Factory was returned to the English by the French. On September 11, 1714, Henry Kelsey returned to York Factory after being 17 years away from the place he had called home. He was now the deputy governor and wrote in his diary that the fort was 
rotten and ready to fall, not scarce defensible against the natives if they have a mind to attack us. In 1717, Kelsey was promoted to governor of York Factory, and a year later he was made the governor of all the Hudson's Bay Company settlements. This new title meant a big bump in pay as well to £200 per year. The young boy, who arrived as an apprentice at York Factory over three decades earlier, was now a seasoned veteran of the company and the most powerful person in Rupert's Land. But as governor, he did not get along with another prominent man in the company, James Knight. James Knight was the chief factor of Fort Albany and became rich through trading. By 1711, he had a seat on the board of directors of the company, and by 1719, he was the head of York Factory. He appeared in my episode on Thanadel Thur a few months back as the man who sent her out on her mission to bring peace between the Cree and the Chippewan. The same year Knight took over York Factory, he accused Kelsey of selling furs privately rather than through the company. And whether this is true or not, the company did not pursue charges. Regardless, it did cause tensions between the men as Kelsey embarked on a trip to the Arctic later in 1719. He left on the Prosperous to explore and prospect for copper on the coast north of Marble Island, a small island on northwestern Hudson Bay. Today, the closest community to it is Rankin Inlet, located 50 kilometers to the west. Unknown to Kelsey at the time, his nemesis, Knight, was also traveling into the Arctic to find the Northwest Passage. Knight outfitted two ships, the Albany and the Discovery, because a Chippewan interpreter said there was a mineral-rich route across the north. When Kelsey returned to York Factory, he found Knight had ventured off on his expedition, and he wrote that Knight wintered off the coast in 1719-20, which spoiled trade with the Inuit because he took up their land. And during the winter, Knight's ships encountered the shallow water between Marble Island and the Canadian mainland. They were wrecked, but the crew were able to offload several cannons, coal, and food. In 1721, Kelsey took a second trip to Marble Island for trade. He had to turn back because of high winds, but he had no intention of actually looking for Knight, despite knowing he was overdue, and Kelsey did not initiate any sort of search. He was given items by the Inuit from the Knight expedition, but instead of venturing further to Marble Island, like I said, he turned around due to poor winds and returned to York Factory. According to the evidence found later, several members of Knight's expedition were still alive on Marble Island, but because no search was launched, Knight and his crew were never seen alive again. Half a century later, Samuel Hearn heard from an elderly Inuk man that only five men were alive through the second winter, and the last man died digging a grave for his companion. From 1684 to 1722, Kelsey had only spent three years away from Canada, 1704, 1705, and 1713. In 1722, Kelsey left the land he had devoted so much of his life to for the final time and returned to England on October 31st. Over the course of his career with the Hudson's Bay Company, Kelsey earned £2,500 through wages and bonuses, about $778,000 today. That's a lot of money, but it's not enough for retirement, which turns out was far too short. Henry Kelsey died on November 1st, 1724. He left his wife and son with little money, and six years after his death, his widow Elizabeth petitioned the Hudson's Bay Company to help pay for her son's apprenticeship. The company gave her 10 guineas, equal to about two ounces of gold. Four years later, the company gave her six guineas to buy clothes for her son. It's not known what happened to her or her son after that. The first European to see bison and the grizzly bear didn't leave much to his family, but Kelsey has been honored extensively in Canada. Kelsey Lake, two schools, a rose, and a dam are all named for him. A stamp was issued honoring him in 1970 by Canada Post. And the call letters of CBC Radio in Saskatchewan are CBK, with the K standing for Kelsey. Now that's the story of Henry Kelsey, but there's one more interesting thing to add to this tale. Little was known 200 years after Henry Kelsey died beyond some records kept by the Hudson's Bay Company. His legendary expedition into the Canadian West had long since been forgotten by everyone but the most ardent researchers. Then, in 1926, Archibald Dobbs was cleaning the library at Castle Dobbs in Northern Ireland, where he found papers kept by his ancestor, Arthur Dobbs, prior to him becoming governor of North Carolina in 1765. 
Archibald quickly realized that the papers were likely very important, and he sent them off to the Public Record Office of Northern Ireland. The Public Record Office discovered that within the papers was Henry Kelsey's journal. In 1929, the Kelsey papers were published by the Public Records Office of Northern Ireland and the Public Archives of Canada. That book proved to be an invaluable resource in crafting this episode. As for how that journal, written in the Canadian West, wound up in Ireland so long after Kelsey died, well, that's a mystery. And it's a mystery we will end this episode on. I hope you enjoyed that episode and our look at Henry Kelsey. Next week, we're looking at the Canadian passengers on the Titanic. This show is researched, produced, and written by me, Craig Baird, with the help of Dila Velasquez. Audio production and design by Rosalind Kufor. If this is your first time listening and you like what you heard, please take a moment and give us a five-star review to help other people find these amazing stories. And there are so many for you to sink your teeth into. If you enjoy this podcast, then please check out my other podcasts, From John to Justin, Canada, A Yearly Journey, Pucks and Cups, and Canada's Great War. We love hearing from you, so if you have a show topic you want me to cover, email me at craig at canadaehx.com or stop by my website and social media. I'll include all of those in my show notes. Until next time, I'm Craig Baird, and this is Canadian History X.